Donald Trump accused of falsifying records to conceal crimes. Donald Trump pleads not guilty to 34 felony criminal charges during a court hearing in New York. The former U.S. president is accused of falsifying records to hide damaging information during the 2016 election. The charges focus on a hush money payment to porn star Stormy Daniels. She claims to have had an affair with Trump, which he denies. The prosecutor also detailed other alleged payoffs to suppress potentially damaging stories, one involving a doorman and another to a former Playboy model. Judge Juan Merchan did not issue a gag order on Trump, but asked both sides to be mindful of their language and rhetoric. The 2024 White House contender has arrived back home in Florida, where he is expected to give a speech at 2015 Eastern Daylight Time on Tuesday. 1.15 British Summer Time Wednesday, what happens next in court case against Trump. Donald Trump has had his day in court, so what next? The process is likely to take many months, with a trial unlikely to start until next year. That means the former president could be in court again right around the same time his campaign for the November 2024 presidential election is kicking into high gear. Until then, this is what the court schedule looks like so far. May 9, according to New York law, the deadline for prosecution to file discovery, which is the evidence each side will use to present its case. June 8, according to New York law, the deadline for the defense to file its discovery. August 8, this is the deadline Trump's team has to file their motions, a legal term for a request made to the judge to make a decision about a specific issue. Trump's lawyer Joe Tacopina said he plans to file a motion to dismiss the case altogether. September 19, the deadline for prosecution to respond to motions. December 4, Judge Juan Merchant will rule on the motions. Who had written a check, $130,000 to Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet about her allegations with an affair. And prosecutors linked it to other things in Trump's past. In 2006, Karen McDougal, a Playboy model, says she had an affair with former President Trump, which she also denied. And there was a doorman that alleged Trump had a, a love child. He was paid off. Trump denied that as well. And taken together, the prosecutors implied there was this scheme to keep all of this information from the American voting public. And in that scheme, that provided the underlying basis for these felony charges of falsifying business records. They said that he had the intent to defraud. Didn't say who, but prosecutors made clear the intent was to defraud the American public on the eve of the 2016 campaign. So, Aaron, we heard another name today that we haven't heard in a while, and that's David Pecker of course, and, and, and tied to um, the National Enquirer and this catch and kill scheme that we, we had covered years back about these stories that, that Trump allegedly was trying to pay him off, you know, to, not to run these stories, um, ugly stories surrounding uh, the former president. Uh, I remember trying to call him during that time. He picked up the phone and hung up on me as soon as I started asking him questions about the former president. But now it's, yes, you did too. <laughs> we, we both called him. And, and now it seems that he is cooperating and, and that he is he is talking to Alvin Bragg. So w what do you think changed here, Aaron? Well, he also had entered into a non-prosecution agreement, uh, American media did, with, with federal prosecutors back in the day. So uh, David Pecker clearly had information that the Manhattan prosecutors wanted. He was the very first witness before the grand jury that started looking into this back in January. And, as it turns out, he was the last witness brought in to reinforce the testimony of Michael Cohen, whose one-time legal advisor, Bob Costello, tried to present a, a different view of Cohen's credibility and reliability. So the grand jury was bookended by David Pecker's testimony. And in each of these cases, a doorman's allegation, a Playboy model's allegation, a porn star's allegation, there was David Pecker, then the publisher of the National Enquirer, to arrange some kind of a hush payment to keep these stories out of the press.
Aaron Katursky, I know it's been a long day. Thank you uh, just so much um, for just rolling with us for so many hours. And Kim Whaley, let's take it to you once again, our, our, our legal uh, beagle here. Uh, you also, too, have been covering this with us uh, for so many years leading up to this point today. Just your overall thoughts on, on where this goes now. I mean, th this, isn't, this isn't it. We're, we're talking clearly about a historical moment in, in history here, the fact that the former president um, ha has, has been indicted. He's pleaded not guilty to 34 counts uh, of, of falsifying um, statements to, to cover up other crimes. Um, but this is going to be a long and windy road. All the litigation, the back and forth, the moves to try and suppress whatever evidence is there, to dismiss um, um, anything the lawyers can, making motions, dismissing charges. This is going to take a while. Listen, as you know, I'm also a constitutional scholar and I'm biased in favor of democracy and transparency. And I think this is a moment we'll look back on the, the before and after, almost like January 6th, before the indictment of a former president and after the indictment of a former president. I think given that there are four other pending criminal investigations, the one in Georgia, plus three federal criminal investigations, Mar-a-Lago, um, January 6th, and then one relating to his Truth Social initial public offering, the discussion around, is it okay to indict a former president, will have faded and we, will, we can talk about the merits. So I think that's, whatever happens with Alvin Bragg, if more follow, uh, this will just normalize this which is going to have profound implications for the Constitution. That being said, he's the front runner for the Republican nomination. Uh, and if he loses, say he's he is a, the nominee and he loses, you know, I, I think it's naive to think there won't be potentially another redo of January 6th, was which was traumatic to the country. And if he does win, I mean, this is a man who has said recently he would gut the Defense uh, Department and the national security agencies and put, put loyalists in there. He said the last Last time he was president that he would consider maybe not respecting the two terms in office. I mean, Donald Trump tells us who he is and he follows up on those things. So in addition to the, as you indicate, the many factual legal uh, questions, including I think what will come up, should he have been immune from certain actions taken while president? He wrote allegedly some of these checks while president. That could go to the Supreme Court of the United States. All the sort of legal technicalities will, will have us on, you know, talking about it for weeks and months. But but there's a really big question hanging the balance here is where do you strike the balance between protection of guardrails around the power of the presidency, which ultimately protects individual rights and this particular man and the precedent that this sets. And, you know, this is something people will be talking about, you know, a century from now. I really believe that, Kira. Well, and let's not forget still the the other investigations that are are still pending surrounding the former president um, from the mob attack uh, on the Capitol to to false allegations um, about a stolen election I mean this um, this is just uh, one more story to add into the mix clearly that we will be following Kim Olivia Rubin our ABC News investigative reporter was actually inside the courtroom for all of this uh, Olivia of course the judge uh, making the decision not to have uh, live cameras in the courtroom um, there was a lot of concern about a big media circus of course there's been lots of interest uh, in what went down today we do have pictures from inside the courtroom so just give us a feel for the tone what you saw what you heard um, any any type of color you can add to what took place as we look at these still pictures. Here, that tone inside of the courtroom was incredibly high intensity, and it was also, as we've noted, a lot longer than anyone expected that it would go in a way. One of the most really striking moments that happened there was when the former president actually first entered inside of the courtroom, first stepping in as that criminal defendant there. He entered the courtroom and he was quite emotionless. He had sort of a grimace on his face that I've described. He looked around the room. He took it in as he made his way forward to the defendant's table. And that's where he sat, Kira, as a defendant. When the judge walked in, he stood up like any defendant would. He sat down when he was told. And really, that's when the judge said, 
let's arraign Mr. Trump, please, and Trump entering that not guilty plea on his own behalf. He did not have his lawyer do it. He did it himself. But even throughout that hearing, we did not hear much from former President Big Trump. Big rally and uh, is free to talk. So, uh, and, and I find that interesting as well, Olivia, that um, there wasn't a gag order. So, so the, pres the former president may have been calm, cool, collected, appearing angry, stern. He surely did his walk and his look to the cameras like he's always done. But he, he for the most part, sounds like, according to you, everything was calm and behavior was good. But tonight could be a totally different story because he can say whatever he wants now, right? Absolutely. The judge absolutely saying that he would not be putting in any sort of gag order right now. I do think it's important to note that while you're absolutely correct, he's going to speak at Mar-a-Lago tonight. He has full access to his social media and we know what he does there. But the judge also not outright dismissing that Trump himself could have to return to New York and go to court again as this case pushes forward. His attorneys had asked for that towards the end of the he hearing, Kira, but the judge chiming in and saying, He's like another criminal defendant, and because of transparency, he was not ready to say that Trump did not have to come back to the courtroom when we're back here in December, Kira. Olivia, thank you so much. And I want to bring in now white-collar defense attorney and former federal prosecutor Shan Wu. Uh, Shan, welcome aboard. Glad to have your perspective, especially with your background. Let me just start with an overall uh, sort of a broad question about strategy here, strategy of this indictment. From a prosecutor's perspective, what do you make of it? Well, what really struck me uh, was there had been a lot of speculation and curiosity uh, if this would be what we call in the prosecution world a speaking indictment. And that means the indictment would be chock full of narrative, really laying out the details of the story that supports the kind of bare bones criminal charges that are brought forth here. This was not a speaking indictment. Rather, it was an indictment which really stuck just to the indictment.